Good morning, church. Great to be with you all this morning. As you can see, the title of today's message is, Are We There Yet? Before we get into this word, I always like to go ahead and just hand the sermon over to the Lord. So if you would just bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful, Lord God, that we can come here and worship in spirit and truth. Lord God, for just the awesome time we've already had in your presence, Lord. And Lord, we thank you, Lord God, that the worship prepares us for your word. And so, Father God, right now, may you just give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand your word. Father God, did you get me out of your way? Come have your way, Father God. And may you take your word and transform our lives, Father God, as our hearts and minds are ready. Father God, that you would take us and do an awesome work in us and in this place here this morning. For it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray and everyone said, Amen. Talking to you today about are we there yet? I heard about a gentleman, he was on a flight and he sat down next to a very beautiful woman and he looked over at him and he couldn't help himself. He said, so what kind of men exactly are you attracted to? And she said, well, I really like Native American men with those high cheekbones and that dark glowing skin. She said, but I also like Jewish men. She said, a lot of them are successful and, and, and do well in life, and I really respect that. And she said, but I also have this funny thing for Southern boys with that, with that Southern draw and, and their mannerisms. And she said, you know, where are you from? What do you do? And he said, what's your name? And he's like, well, and he paused for a second, and he looked at her, and he just thought, and he said, well, my first name is Geronimo, <laughs> and my second name is Bernstein. And then he said, but all my friends call me Bubba. (laughs) Are we there yet? This summer I took a very long trip, the longest trip I've ever been on with kids. And it was nearly a traumatic experience, but I'm okay. It It didn't affect me too bad. We went all the way to Branson, Missouri with a five-year-old and a six-year-old. Yes, right now you're wondering if your pastor is wise. So is he. But we did pray about it. And and MapQuest said, you know, it's 13 hours to get there. But they need to have with the five and six-year-old time slotted in there somewhere. It's more like 20 to 100 hours getting there with a five and a six-year-old. And as we went along... (laughs) We didn't make it out of West Virginia before we heard the phrase, are we there yet? And then it was, when are we going to get there? Dad, why is this taking so long? And the funny thing is, is I believe our Heavenly Father hears the same from us a lot. I don't know about you, but I am guilty of the, oh, are we there yet, God? Why is this taking so long? Why is this so hard? Why do we have to have all these detours? Why are all these things happening to me? See, the boys were very excited to get to Branson. They just weren't excited about the process of getting to Branson. And in the church, we have designed a church world in America that's very excited, listen, about our purpose but we are not so excited about the process of stepping into our purpose. We have purpose-driven Christians and purpose-driven churches, and there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself, but what we've designed is a lot of people that know their purpose, but they're frustrated because they don't know how to live in the process. They're all excited about when they get there, but they're not at all enjoying the journey of getting there. But Jesus said that He came that we might have life and what? Have it more abundantly. Have it to the full and enjoy it until it overflows. And the fact of the matter is, most of our life is a journey, not the destination. And unless we teach the church how to enjoy the process, the church is not going to have much joy or life in it. Because most of our life is about getting there. It's not about being there. And the moment we think we're arrived, you know what God says? Time for a new journey. Time for a new process. Are you hearing me? And so the church has bought into the world's bit of I'll be happy when. No, 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 no. We have joy now. Amen. 
if we can learn to enjoy now, we'll really enjoy then. But I say this respectfully. If we can't learn to enjoy now, if we can't learn to be happy now, we won't be happy then. And people say, oh, I'll be happy when, when I get that house or I get that job or when I get that man or when this man goes away and all that kind of stuff. And See, it's, it's, it's all those I'll be happy wins. We're always postponing when we'll actually enjoy our life in Jesus. But God is wanting to teach us how to enjoy every day in our life with Jesus. Amen, church. Amen. Amen. And you went along this process. Yeah, I didn't get half hour from the house and I hit road work. And you know what? I could just sit there and get frustrated, but the fact of the matter is road work in our lives is paving the way for us to get where we want to be. Did you hear that? I can yell about the road work, but it's a blessing. Did you hear that? And sometimes there's going to be accidents. You know what? And sometimes we can be upset because somebody else's mistake, it seems like it's messing up our life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But tell me if you all remember, God works all things together for good. Nobody can keep me from my purpose and destiny. Amen. Amen. And thankfully, I can't either because sometimes the accidents are caused by ourselves, aren't they? Amen. And so there will be accidents in the process. There will be road work in the process. How many of you all know God sometimes will give us detours in the process? He sees something up ahead that He wants to avoid. He doesn't want us to go through that. And so you know what He does? He takes us on a route we didn't know about. And so we thought we were just going to go straight from here to there. We thought we had it all planned out. And God says, kind of chuckles. He says, no, you didn't see all the problems, all the things that were going to happen that I'm saving you from. Amen. Church, are we going to learn how to enjoy the journey this morning? Hallelujah. Are we going to learn how to enjoy life? Because our life is mostly about getting there. The Bible speaks of Joshua. He's the man who finally led Israel into the promised land. God promised him, he said, every place where the sole of your foot treads, I've already given it to you. It's all yours. I've given it to you. But listen to this. He says it's all yours, but you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to fight for what's yours, church. If you want to enjoy the journey, if you want to walk into your destiny and your purpose, you'll have to fight for it. I'm telling you this this morning. Deuteronomy 7.22, he says, And the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you, speaking to Joshua. Remember, there were seven nations in the land, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites. I could go on and on and on there. He says, I'm going to drive them out. But notice how he does it. Little by little. There's a lot of wisdom in those three words. Little by little, you will be unable to destroy them at once. Isn't that what we all want? We want a miracle to zap us from here to there right now. It's like we've got a remote. And if we had our way, we would say, oh, that looks hard. Fast forward. Oh, that looks sad. Fast forward. Oh, that looks disappointing. Fast forward. Before we know it, we've wished our whole life away. But all those things, listen, you want a miracle to get you there. But listen, going through the hard times will give you the character to keep you there. The thing we would skip is the thing that will prepare us. See, the miracle will get you to your destiny, but your character will keep you there. And so you need to go through these trials. He says it's going to be little by little. It's going to be little by little. You'll be unable to destroy them all at once. Notice this, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. In other words, if God gave you everything you want right now, you would be overwhelmed and overrun. We think we're ready now, but God knows better. He knows how much character we have. He knows how much skill we've developed. And you know what he's saying? You're not ready for all of it at once. I'm going to give it to you a little bit at a time. That way when you get it, you'll enjoy it, you'll be ready for it, and you'll handle it well. That's some pretty good teaching, by the way. See, what we don't realize is this. As the church teaches this, you have Jesus in your heart and it's true. But how many of you all know this fact? And it is a fact. You still have Adam and Eve in your bones. And God is still doing a work on the inside, isn't He? None of us have arrived yet, have we? But we're on our way. Turn to your neighbor and say, patient with me. God isn't finished with me yet. Amen? Be patient with me. God isn't finished with me yet. But He's still working. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident 
of this very thing. That word confident means I'm totally persuaded. I love this verse. It's why I read it every now and then. That He who has begun a good work in you will what? Complete it. He'll carry it on through until the day of Jesus Christ. Listen, God is going to complete in you what He begun in you. He's the author, but He's also the what? Finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for when in due time, in the right season, we shall reap if we do not what? Lose heart. And I ask you a question this morning. Let's be honest with one another. Do you sometimes get frustrated in the process? Anybody ever get discouraged in the process? Anybody but me sometimes ever just flat out feel defeated in the process? The things in my life, they're not going my way. They're not going the way I planned. There's all these detours, all this road work, all these accidents, all these things that I didn't plan for. And it can be so frustrating. But God is saying this morning, don't grow weary in doing good. You are going to reap your harvest in due time, at the right time. God is going to bring you through. He who began a good work in you will complete it. Lincoln started playing football this fall. He's only six. It's his first year. Yes, he's a mighty might. He's only been to a couple weeks of practice. They hadn't even practiced two weeks and they had their first scrimmage. And they got up and they played of all places Lewis County. Can you believe that, Adam? (laughs) And to much of my dismay, Lewis County did pretty good. The boys did okay, but I think Lewis County was doing just a little better. And at the end of the scrimmage, I love what the coach said. He got them all together and he said, I bet you some of you are kind of disappointed. You hoped you would do better. But he began to point out all the things they had done right. And then listen to what he said. He said, listen, you've only been practicing for less than two weeks. This is your first scrimmage. He said, you got another scrimmage and two more weeks of practice before you even get to your first game. He said, you're going to keep getting better all the, through that time. He said, you're not going to reach your peak until probably halfway into the season. He said, we've just get, gotten started. And this is the next phrase he used. Trust the process. And you know what God is saying for us to enjoy this journey? We just need to learn to, first of all, trust the process. Is that good, church? Amen. Amen. By the way, Lincoln hardly knows anything about football, but he already scored his first touchdown yesterday. Amen. Trust the process. Turn in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 4. After Israel was taken into captivity, the temple was destroyed, Jerusalem was destroyed. According to God's prophecy through Jeremiah, after 70 years, they would return. And sure enough, that's what happened. And their leader was a man named Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel brought God's people back to Jerusalem. And they began shortly thereafter to rebuild the temple, the house of worship. And they laid the foundation. And how many of you all think that the enemy just sat by and let him do that? The enemy just said, you know, it's nice that they're rebuilding their life in the Lord. It's nice that they're having victory. Hooray, hooray. No, he went on full out war. The moment you decide to trust the process, I hate to tell you this, but the attack will continue. And so he begins to rebuild and the discouragement comes. The enemy begins to threaten him. Begins to tell lies about him to the king. And because, listen, of all that discouragement from the outside and on the inside, because the people began to despair. How many of you all know the people around you sometimes can discourage you more than the situation can? And he bought into their lines and he quit building. They laid the foundation and they stopped. And for almost 20 years, the temple just sat there. It's the foundation. Nothing else happened. But you know what God did? He raised up a prophet to come and encourage and to begin to light a fire back under Zerubbabel and God's people. And I believe that's what God does in our lives. Sometimes we quit. We've got a foundation, and there's a lot of Christians that have a foundation. They know that God's their Savior. They believe they're going to heaven. They They know some of the Bible basics. And for some reason, because of the attack of the enemy, they gave up and kind of stopped there. And they're just camping on that elementary salvation. And they haven't went on into the purpose and the plan and the destiny that God has for them. And they're kind of camping right there. Anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? How many of you all kind of feel like you're somewhere between the foundation and the building complete? 
You know what I'm talking about. And the enemy's trying to keep you from getting there. And listen to what the prophet Zechariah says to Zerubbabel. It says in verse, uh, verse 9, The hand of Zerubbabel, you have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also, what? Finish it. Remember, he who has begun a good work in you shall also, what? Complete it until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Zerubbabel, your hands started this work. Not, listen, he probably thought somebody else would finish what God had started with him. But he says, God says, no, no, no. Notice this. He says, then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Notice this. And this is where we are often. Verse 10. For who has despised the day of what? Small things. So often we have this small beginning. We have this small start. And listen. So often, your anointing will come before the appointment. You're anointed before you're appointed. Do you remember when King David was anointed? He was out in the shepherd's field. Finally, Jesse, his dad, brings him in. God says to the prophet Samuel, this is the one. He anoints his head with oil and declares him to be the king of Israel. And what's the next thing he did? Did he go sit down on a throne? No, he went back out to the shepherd's field. Don't despise the day of small things. When you have this great anointing, but your appointment hasn't happened yet, you're on a journey now. You've just entered the process. You have a dream, but you haven't reached your destination. I remember this happening to me. You know what? In the church world, the truth of the matter is, most of the time, preachers, you know what they'll ask you about? How big is your building and how many people do you have? But you know what God says? Don't despise the day of small things. You know what it says when I stand before Him? He's not going to question me on how big my building was or how many people I had. The question was, was I faithful to what He called me to? Did you hear that? If I've been faithful with small things, you know what He'll say? Well done, good and faithful servant. And He won't say, well done, good and popular servant, or good and wealthy servant, or good and successful servant. Did you hear that? Good and famous or brilliant servant. It will be about whether I was faithful to what He called me to. Whether I stuck it out. What I set my hands to start, I also kept my hands to to finish. Hallelujah. Amen. And some of you say, well, Pastor, I've tried and I've failed. I just can't do it. You don't understand. Yes, I do. And I agree. You can't do it. You cannot, listen, go into your God-given destiny in your own strength. It will take the power of God in order to fulfill the dream and the purpose of God in your life. You will need the power of God to fulfill the purpose of God. Skip back to verse 6. Notice what Zechariah says to Zerubbabel here, verse 6. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but notice this, by my spirit says the Lord. It's not going to be by human brains or brawn. It's going to be by God's ability and power. The American church, years ago, a missionary came here from China. He wanted to take back what he learned from the American church because our churches are large and they seem to have a lot of power. But what he noticed was this. Before he went back, they asked him, he said, what's the biggest thing you learned about the American church? He said, the thing that I've learned the most that amazes me the most is how much the American church can do without God. have all the money, all the wealth, all the influence, and no anointing or power. And without the anointing and the power, I have nothing. It's not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit. And what we need in America is a revival of the Spirit and the presence of God in our churches. We need the power of God again. You don't need me to tickle your ears this morning. You don't need entertainment. You need to be touched by the power and the presence of Almighty God. Hallelujah. You can take an atheist, and if they'll get in the glory, they'll walk out a believer. Did you hear that? I don't need to convince them. I need to introduce them. Hallelujah. My God is real. I never have any doubt whether He's real because I've been in His presence. I've been in His glory. I've seen Him work miracles. 
My argument is my life. And so I don't need to argue. I'll just tell you my testimony. Hallelujah. My God isn't dead and I am not, listen, I'm not intimidated by egg-headed liberals who want to put me down. Hallelujah. They're the ones that need to get a life and quit calling everybody else bad names all the time. Hallelujah. <laughs> that felt good. Thank you, Lord. Verse 7. Verse 7. Oh, your professor wouldn't be so miserable if he'd just meet Jesus. I'm just telling you the truth. Verse 7, Who are you, all great mountain? What is the mountain? It's the opposition. It's everything coming against you. It's all those obstacles. It's all that road work. All those things that are happening, that are discouraging you, that are defeating you. What are you? Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become what? A plain. He shall bring forth the capstone. That is the headstone when you finish the building. The guy who laid the foundation is also going to set the headstone. And notice this. He's going to enjoy the whole thing with shouts of what? grace to it. The blessings and the favor of Almighty God are upon you and upon the call that He has on your life. I speak grace, grace over you this morning. The work that God has begun in you, He's going to complete it. And you're going to enjoy the journey. You're going to enjoy the process. And listen, you are going to see the dream He's given you come to pass. I remember years ago, and I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, there's an older lady that used to come here. Her name was Dawn Queen. And early on, she began to share with me. She said, Pastor, you don't understand. She said, I know how it looks. She said, and I know that things that happened here way back when. She said, but the Lord has shown me so clear in prayer. He's shown me over and over again that this building, God is going to fill it up, and He's going to make it a lighthouse in Buchanan. And she kept speaking that. And, and she would say, I, I know you could get discouraged. And she, would kept, she kept speaking life into me. And you know what? As time went on, I remember hitting a wall about halfway into my pastor here. And, and I was thinking, you know, I think God's probably done with me here. I got something good going. And you know what? God brought me to this passage in Zechariah. That, listen, he said, your hands began the work and your hands shall finish the work. Amen? Did you hear that? <laughs> he said, no, you're not done. Keep going. Hallelujah. I began the work in you, and I'm going to finish the work through you. Listen, God said, you started, and you're going to finish it. Amen? Is that a good word or what? She never got to see this with her natural eyes. I have, but she saw it with her spiritual eyes. How many of y'all know that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen? But she saw it, and through her encouragement, I saw it too, and now I see it. Isn't that awesome? In 1 Peter 5.10 it says, But may the God of all grace, who called us to His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, notice this phrase, after you have suffered a little while. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's just for a little while. After you have suffered for a little while, notice what He'll do. He will perfect you. That means complete what He started. He will establish you. You know what that means? Make you steadfast where you never quit. To be steadfast. Strengthen you. Where does your strength come from? The Holy Spirit, the power of God. And notice this, settle you. That means to have a solid foundation. What did Jesus say a wise man was like? He said, I'll liken him. And what? A person who built his house upon the rock. And the rains came, and the floods beat against it, and the winds blew. But what? The house stood. Because it was founded upon the rock. Listen, after you suffered a little while, you're going to be the kind of person that the enemy doesn't know what to do with anymore. He's trying his best to stop you, but on the other end of his best, you'll look back and say, is that all you have? The enemy tried his best, and his best didn't work. I'm still here. (laughs) 
James chapter 1, verse 2. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when everything's going your way. No, when you fall into various trials. And notice this, he doesn't just say a trial. He says various ones. All at the same time. You ever have a time when everything goes wrong all at once? Financially, physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, everything seems to fall apart in your life. You know what God says? Cheer up because He's about ready to do something big. Hallelujah. The enemy's unleashing everything full barrels because he's scared of you and what God's about ready to do in you and through you. He says, knowing, knowing that the testing of your faith, you've got to know this, it produces patience, which also means endurance. In other words, this is what I'm saying to you this morning. The devil could never stop a person who just won't quit. The church hasn't gotten a hold of this, but it's going to get a hold of this. The devil can't stop you because you just won't stop. It's just that simple. He says in verse 4, but let patience have its perfect work. In other words, let this season, listen, let this season do and build inside of you the character that God intends for you to have, that you may be perfect and complete. Notice this, lacking how much? Nothing. In other words, when you come to this, the end of this, because you were willing to go through the fire, you were willing to go through the trial, and you wouldn't give up, but you trusted God in the process, on the other end, you're going to look back and you're going to say, you know what, I understand now that no matter what the enemy throws my way, he is my Savior, he is my healer, he is my provider, he will get me through it. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. You come to the other end being the kind of person that says, I won't quit no matter what. I don't need somebody to tell me, oh, you're you're a good preacher or any of those things. The only real compliment I want to hear is this. You are obedient to your heavenly Father. Hallelujah. You are faithful to Him. And you live for Him. Listen, I remember preaching, listen, for years when nobody clapped. (laughs) Nobody said anything. Nobody said amen, hardly ever. They kind of just stared at me. You know what I'm talking about? And I preached then like I do now. Hallelujah. Amen. If you can preach to ten in passion, He'll give you hundreds. Do you hear that? If, listen, and it maybe if you preach to hundreds in passion with fire, He may even set you before thousands. But you know what? You didn't get up there for that anyways. Hallelujah. Oh, I might start preaching this morning. See, this process is a lot like a pregnancy. God sets a dream in you and it begins to grow. And you know what happens near the end? When Sarah was carrying Lincoln, our firstborn son, she looked like she was carrying triplets. He was huge, and and her waist, she was very small. And so she was very miserable. You know what? We went to the doctor, and you know what? He wasn't concerned. You know why? Because it's all part of the process. We were getting close to the end, and it was getting very uncomfortable and painful. But you know what? That was part of the process. You may be getting uncomfortable. It may be painful, but it's not unusual. And it means you're getting close. Listen, when you feel like you're having to push with all your might, what are you getting ready to do? Deliver. And some of you are having to push with everything you have right now. And God is saying, it's on the way. You're in the waiting room and it's about ready to happen. Don't give up now. Push on through. Listen, listen. When that child came, we couldn't have been any more happy. And along that journey to Branson, my wife's better at this than I am because I just want to like yell. (laughs) But she would try to play games with him, you know, and and try to get him to sing with her. And we point out things, oh, look at those horses. You know, oh, look at that, look at that big building over there. Hey, have you ever seen a city this big before? We're doing everything we can to bring joy into the vehicle by getting their eyes off of the problems and back on to the good things in the process of getting there. And you know what? If we're going to step into our destiny, and listen, we're going to learn to do this the right way, 
We're going to trust the process. And number two, we're going to learn to enjoy the journey. This has been one of the most difficult things for me at times. I'm a future-oriented person, if you haven't noticed. Vision just comes natural to me. You know, pastors are supposed to be visionary, and well, I am. The only thing I struggle with is right now. Because I've been down there for a long time, way down the road. And I'm like, when are we ever going to get there, God? Come on here. And listen, God has been teaching me this. And here recently, I've been going through a process again. And I was praying and I was seeking God and I was complaining to God, when are we going to get there? All those lines. And listen, all of a sudden, listen, I don't see visions all the time, but I saw a simple vision of a timeline. And it, it wasn't very long. At the end of it, I could see the completion of where I was going. And then I saw me walking down the road. And you know what I had on my face? Not a frown, not a scowl, but a smile. And you know what God said to me? He said, you're all worried about it. He says, it's only a matter of time. Enjoy the journey. And you know what? In the moment, I didn't want to hear that. I wanted to argue with him because I wanted it now. But he wants more than that for me. He doesn't want me and my joy to be tied up to then. He wants me to enjoy now. And if I can enjoy now, I'll enjoy then even more. Is that good word or what? Enjoy the journey. Proverbs 17, verse 22 says, A merry heart does good like medicine. I ask you Christian people, have you been taking your medicine? Listen, sometimes Christians can be the most serious people I've ever been around. You can't joke around them. You can't pick on them. You can't tell them a joke. They just get real serious on you. Listen, Jesus was anything but a stick in the mud. Hallelujah. His first miracle is to keep the party going. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. That's my Jesus. He's not a stick in the mud, and He definitely didn't make me one. Being super serious doesn't make you super spiritual. It just makes you super irritating. Hallelujah. Let's get real. I'm not going to walk on eggshells around Christians anymore. If you want to be an eggshell, you're going to get busted. And it's going to be good for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you want to be super serious, I'm going to keep on being super joyful anyways. Because it's good medicine. Listen, it's the broken spirit that dries the bones. And so we're always saying, I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when. No, we're going to be happy now. In Isaiah 55, he speaks of those coming out of bondage. And notice this, he says, they'll enjoy the trip. He says in Isaiah 55, 12, for you shall go out. You shall go on your journey with what? Joy. And he didn't say you'll be joyful when you get there. You'll be joyful on the way. Notice this, and you'll be led out with what? Peace. You're going to enjoy the trip with joy and peace. He says, the mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you. In other words, God is going to be celebrating the fact that you've learned to walk in His presence. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Hallelujah. We are learning right now how to be joyful right now. We're learning how to enjoy the journey no matter what. See, the enemy's trying to tell you that you can't enjoy life when things aren't all going your way. But you know, we serve a God that's bigger than our circumstances. Hallelujah. And the scriptures say, in His presence there is what? Fullness of joy. Is there anything happening to you that can keep you from God's presence? And if God is your source of joy, is there anything the enemy can do to you to steal your joy? No. Nothing. He is powerless with a joyful Christian. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And you need to join with our song this morning. There ain't nothing going to steal my joy. And I love the double negative there. Amen. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. Just a couple more scriptures here this morning. Notice his declaration. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines... In other words, I don't see anything good coming out of this, God. Though the labor of the olive may fail. Lord, I know I reap what I sow, but I don't seem to be reaping anything good. He says, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Notice his declaration. Yet, I will. I will. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time for you to declare, I will. 
It's time for you to declare, I will. I will rejoice in the Lord. I love to look up these words. The word rejoice here means to leap for joy. And notice the next phrase, he says, I will joy. It's a different word in the Hebrew. I will join the Lord of my, God of my salvation. This word joy means to spend violently under the influence of violent emotion. I think of King David carrying the ark of the presence back into Jerusalem. And the Bible says that he danced before the Lord with all his might. He was undignified as he lifted up his praise to God. In his presence is fullness of joy. Not a little bit. The fullness thereof. It's time for the church to leap for joy. It's time for us to dance in the presence again. Nurse 19, the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet, notice this, like deer's feet. He will make me walk on high hills. What is that saying? The enemy put the highest obstacle. And you know what God did? He equipped you to go over it. Did you hear that? He brought the greatest opposition, the greatest discouragement that he could muster up. And God just equipped you in the process to go over that mountain. Hallelujah. Anybody here ready to walk on top of your mountain? The thing the enemy thought he had you down with, you're going to stand on top of. Did you hear that? Joshua led the people into the promised land and bit by bit, little by little, God did exactly what He said He would do. And in the midst of a battle, they were winning. And He called for the sun to stand still. Sometimes you just need a little more time, don't you? And these kings had run into a cave. I wasn't planning to talk about this, but I feel led to. They hid in this cave. And so Joshua just left them there to the end of the day. And He brought His men back. And they were so afraid of those kings, they trembled before them. And you know what Joshua did? He had them get down on the ground, and he put his foot on their head. Listen, the enemy is under your feet in Jesus' name. You will set your feet upon those high places. Those mountains that the enemy tried to de defeat you with, discourage you with, try to intimidate you with, I feel intimidation in this house. There's been people that the enemy's been trying to intimidate you, been trying to threaten you, and listen, he's nothing but a liar. He's a thief and a liar. He can't tell the truth, but Jesus came to set you free this morning. Put your foot on his neck in Jesus' name. Declare that you have the victory. Rejoice in your God this morning. That'll preach. I heard a preacher talking about this. It takes an elephant about two years to give birth. Two years of carrying this process through. And you can think in those two years' time, we just recently got a dog. It takes a dog about nine weeks or so. Not to even give birth to just one, but a dozen or so puppies. Cats, same way. Some of you all know that too. And I can just see the dog looking up at the elephant after a couple of years saying, you know, I've had like a half a dozen litters already. <laughs> and you think you're pregnant? What's wrong with you? And you know what the enemy's trying to say that to you? What's wrong with you? Why is it taking so long? But you need to look back at the enemy and say, realize, God's getting ready to birth something great in me. That elephant looked back at that dog and said, I'm getting ready to give birth to something, not something ordinary, but something extraordinary. Yeah. Amen? Something great and something mighty. She's not carrying a dog. She's carrying an elephant. <laughs> Listen, amen. And God has placed something awesome inside of you. His plan for you. Listen, it may look small in the beginning, but don't despise the day of small things. What starts small, that gestation is very small, but what's going to be in the other end is awesome. If you'll carry it on through. And he who has begun a good work in you, he's going to complete it. Listen, you have a God-sized dream, purpose, and destiny. Notice Habakkuk 2.3, our last scripture. This vision, the purpose and plan of God for your life, the thing that he's shown you, that he's created you to do, it is yet for an appointed time. God hasn't forgotten about it. He hasn't given up on you. It's for what? An appointed time. It's just on the timeline, and it's just a matter of time. The only thing that could ever stop you is that you give up before you get there. Other than that, you're on your way. And the enemy cannot stop 
anyone who just simply will not quit. He says, but at the end it will speak. In other words, when the process is over, it will speak. And it will not lie. The thing God you put on your heart, it's not a lie. It's not an apparition. You just didn't have something funny for breakfast that day and got a crazy idea. The Lord has given you a dream and a purpose. He says, though it tarries, notice this phrase, wait for it. Even if it doesn't happen right now, even if it seems to be delayed forever and you want to scream out, why aren't we there yet, God? Why is this taking so long? Why is this so hard? He says in the next phrase, because surely it will surely come. Notice he didn't say it might come. It will surely come and it will not tarry. In other words, it won't be one second late. God's plan is coming right on time. I just spoke the word of God over this church. It may seem like it's taking forever, but it's going to be right on time. It's not a matter of if, it's just when. And it's going to be so much bigger and greater than you could even imagine. When I was a kid back in the Stone Age, we had these toys that you would wind up. How many of you guys remember the wind-up car? Some of you girls may have played with them too. And you get those things all wind up. And when you get to the end of the, of the springs and the gears, what would happen? It would all of a sudden just, it would stop. Because that's the breaking point. If you were to keep going, you would destroy it. And you feel like God's wound you as tight as you can go. But he knows your breaking point. And what happens when you reach that peak point of tension and then you're finally released? You're propelled by the force of the tension at amazing speed. And God here this morning, I want to read this last phrase. Listen, can I read this last phrase? Will it come up? <laughs> Let God propel you into your destiny. He's like an archer stretching the string. And when it's to the point of perfect tension, he'll release you. And when you go, listen, what seemed to take forever will happen almost all of a sudden. Listen, King David is anointed. He goes back out into the fields. It took 13 years, but in one day, he sat down on the throne of king. 13 years of waiting, of getting pulled in tension, but when God saw that he was ready, he released him in an instant. Listen, you think of Joseph thrown into a pit, thrown into slavery, thrown into prison. Once again, after 13 years, in one day, Pharaoh set him down in his right hand. When God saw that he was fully ready, he released him. Yep. i got to tell you something. Worship team, come forward. This just tickles me. Some conversations I've had of late. Can I share one more story? Is that all right with you? I'm going to tell it whether it is or not anyway. So <laughs> I've got the microphone, you see. <laughs> For most of the time here, I've been here, I'm in my 11th year as pastor. And for the first eight years, I, I baptized on average about seven people every year. And, and to be honest with you, in the history of the church, that was actually good. The, I'm not bragging, but the pastor before me never baptized seven people in his whole tenure. And so it, God began restoring the church. It, it grew that whole time, but it was like a snail's race. You know, it was like two, watching two snails trying to get three inches in a day. And it, it could be very discouraging at times. And all the while, people like Don Queen saying, it'll fill up. Don't give up. And all of these things. But you know what? About year nine, I baptized 14. It doubled. You know what happened the next year? It doubled again. And you know what? This year, we've already almost baptized as many people as we did last year. We're up to like 45 baptisms, and it's only August. We're on course to baptize as many people this year as we did all the years before. Did you hear that? That's how God works. He winds you up and then He lets you go. Hallelujah. What you began, you're going to finish. 
what you started, He's going to work all the way through you and He's going to complete it with the same hands that began the work. He said to me, I use you to begin to restore the church and I'll use you to lead you to its restoration. Hallelujah. That'll preach. And I've had people look at me recently and they're like, what did you do? And I'm like, I didn't quit. Hallelujah. That like, what, What's your secret? I didn't stop. Did you hear that? It's all I did. I relied on God's strength, and so I didn't stop, and I did not quit. And I've had him say to me, well, didn't your church just start growing like a year ago? I said, no, it's been growing the whole time. You just noticed. <laughs> And you know what? There's people looking at you, they think you're ordinary, but God says you're extraordinary. They just haven't noticed yet. But one day they're going to look at you and say, what did God do with you? How did that happen in your life? And you're going to say, I was this person all along. You just didn't notice it yet. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. I could go into preaching now. God has a destiny for you. He, you're just spending some time under tension right now. And He's about ready to let you go. And listen, He's not done with me yet either. I'm only 38, praise God. Hallelujah. This isn't it yet either, praise God. 20 years down the road, who knows? And if you think you know me now, but you don't know me then, you don't know me now either. Hallelujah. Did you hear that? Oh, hallelujah. We think we know one another. I may mean, I think I know what God created Adam to do. You know what? God knows what He created Adam to do. And He'll lay down His heart and Adam will follow that plan. Not my plan for his life, but God's plan. And it's time for you to be encouraged this morning. Follow God's plan for your life. Know what somebody else thinks about you, what they said about you. Just pay attention to what God says about you and what He thinks. Amen. And you'll go further than you ever dreamed. Let's stand up this morning, church. It's time the church learn to enjoy the process and let God propel it into its destiny. Hallelujah. Here you are this morning, church. These altars are open. I don't know what's hitting you that's discouraging you, that's weighing you down, that's frankly been winning, it feels like. But Jesus has defeated that already through the cross. Jesus already bore our sin. He already defeated death, hell, and the grave. Victory is yours through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Here this morning, these altars are open for the church to come, listen, and enjoy not only your destiny, but enjoy the journey. And trust the process. Your God's working all things together for good to those who love Him and are the called according to His purpose. Amen.